What's up? What up? What up? Whew. Team, you know that we have a lot of fun with these. And people ask me sometimes, why do you have only one headphone in? And my answer is, so I can hear out this ear and so I don't have EMF shooting through my head with these AirPods. Because they're great, but the, you know... You read the ratings on them and you're like, they're shooting shit right in your head. You ready to rock? Let's do this. I got Sylvie coming on. Sylvie's an attachment queen. So we're going to talk about probably one of the most important theories that you can learn about. What's up, Sylvie? Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I see already someone's like, how to deal with an avoidant person. <laughs> avoid them back. Just avoid them back. That's the way to do it. He's like, yeah, I forgot to text you. Sorry, my bad. No, just kidding. That's playing games. Um, hi, welcome. Thank you. So excited yes. for this. Me too. And um, I think I just called you the attachment queen, by the way, before oh. you got on. Have you gone by that? Like when people are like, what are you? And you're like, I'm an attachment <laughs> badass. Well, that is a beautiful compliment. I will receive it, but with humility. <laughs> I don't think people really understand till they learn about it. So I want, as you guys are watching this, if you're not sure even what I'm talking about, you're like attachment. What is this? Like a mole? Like what kind of thing is this? <laughs> no, so we're like, we're going to get a little more into it. And I think um, it's important to recognize that it's I think in my own personal opinion, in learning about it, it was probably, I would say it easily is the, the best way to understand how we organize in relationship and how the sort of systems of relationship work. Um, and it's like such a simple way of doing it to recognize. The other beautiful thing about attachment is that it makes you realize that it's a collection of behaviors that are not who you are. They're just like adaptive behaviors that are important to understand. And if we understand them, then we realize that patterns and behaviors are not who you are and you can change them. So, so maybe we should get into this, right? Like, so first off, what is attachment theory, please? What is it? So I think it's so great that we're diving into that because I want to make sure that people really get how fluid this map really is. And attachment theory is essentially the way that we bonded with our primary caregivers when we were young. It was all about survival. It was about making sure that we had our needs met. And the way that in, in which we bonded with our primary, the main person that was responsible for tuning into us, making sure that we, we were fed, we were emotionally attuned to, becomes mirrored in our adult relationships. And I love how you said that, you know, it's not fixed. It's not you know, injected in our DNA, but having an awareness of how we were wired in those earlier few years, it gives us so much power. It gives us so much space to be able to bring that information from that unconscious level to our conscious awareness so that we can actually look at those behaviors objectively and see, okay, am I creating the kinds of relationships that are feeling good? Are they reciprocal? Are they fulfilling? Am I you know, perhaps unknowingly pushing people away or never taking risks to be vulnerable. So understanding how, you know, those first few years really shaped us. For me, it's been the most empowering map as well. And, you know, it takes some time to really, really use the map in a very nuanced way and to not get really boxed into the styles, but really noticing what behaviors we identify with most so that we can do things differently if we're not creating the kind of relationships that we want to create. When I think of like one thing that you said in the podcast that we did together is when people say like, I am anxious, I am avoidant, that they're like identifying with that thing uh, as opposed to there's a collection of behaviors that I tend to maybe be more um, prone to but as soon as we say I am something, you then have to be the damn thing, as opposed to saying I'm prone to something or sometimes I feel this way or sometimes I do this. Separating self from, from behavior, um, but also recognizing the value in, like what I found so useful about attachment theory is I really felt witnessed in a way. Like all of a sudden I was like, oh, 
I, it's not just me. Like I'm not the only one who, when someone doesn't text me back, I'm like, oh, I should probably call them six times. You know, like, <laughs> and then I'm like afraid they're gonna reject me. And somehow they reject me if I call six times, that's really weird. Uh, and so we just sort of keep living in these patterns, not realizing that, oh man, like what you just said, like you can change it. Like this isn't some life sentence where all of a sudden you have a, in your DNA, like you are anxious forever. It's like, no, and there's value in it. Like there's value in knowing that whatever your attachment style you might be more prone to was actually to protect you from being hurt, to like create security, you know, like it's so that it comes from a good place. It wasn't like some malicious, like we're gonna run from everyone who's good for us because we're just a bad, we're just not smart. It's like, no, we're gonna run from love because maybe love is associated with suffering or pain or trauma or hurt. Um, and so how do we move towards it? So, so we should probably get into the different attachment styles. And, and so we've established they're correlated to our early attachment to a primary caregiver. And, and then we could just like go through what are the different styles and what do they look like, feel like? Sure. So this theory was originated by John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth. Got to give them credit right off the bat. These brilliant minds, humans. Shout out. Shout who out. have transformed relationships and ability to create so much more awareness around reciprocal relating. And so when, when we're looking at what secure attachment looks like in childhood, that is relating to a caregiver that was really present most of the time, tuned in to the needs of a child in a way that really was appropriate. You know, that's the word appropriate tuning in. Because you could have a caregiver that is there, but is not really responding to the needs in a way that is making sense for what that child wants. And so again, that is not about perfection, but it's enough repetitive consistency and reliability that that child grows up to be an adult that has um, more trust in relationships, the ability to be more direct and clear about their needs. And it just has more room to be reciprocal because they were tended to in a way that was so much more emotionally attuned. And so again, there's that level of trust in adult relationships, there's that level of, um, I can really ask for what my needs are because I have evidence that they're gonna be responded to and responded to appropriately. And when we look at anxious attachment, the, res the relationship with the caregiver is inconsistent. There's like a key word for each of the styles. It's like, yes, sometimes my caregiver was really there, really responsive, but other times they were not for whatever reason, you know, maybe they were going through their own um, challenging experiences. Maybe there were mental health things going on, or maybe they just didn't have someone that was really attuned to them. So they were just repeating these family cycles. It happens. And mm -hmm. so that inconsistency creates a lot of anxiety for someone as they uh, relate to adults in their later relationships. Makes so sense. I'm used, right? Like I'm used to having connections sometimes, but sometimes it's not. So when you don't respond to me, I'm my, my, my alarm system starts to go off and I want to reach out, reach out, reach out so that I can get back to feeling connected, get, you know, reaching back to that safety with whoever I'm relating to, whether it's a partner or a friend. And then for people that have more avoidant, dismissive avoidant tendencies, um, it was oftentimes a lack of responsiveness. So maybe a more logical response from caregivers, but not really an emotional attunement, being shamed for needs, being rejected for having needs. So that child really goes inward and starts to auto-regulate. And as an adult, we see people that have a lot of dismissive, dismissive avoidant tendencies being really self-reliant, really, you know, all about taking care of myself because of course they, they are. It's like, it makes perfect sense if they didn't feel safe to have someone to rely on for their emotional needs, that they're going to be, you know, they're going to struggle to trust. They're going to struggle to reach out and express that they even have needs in the first place. And then for uh, fearful avoidant, we have people that had this experience of having a fearful caregiver, fear like someone that was very frightening. Maybe they were going through their own traumas or losses. And this came later on on the map um, through Mary Main and Judy Solomon. And so um, this is someone that may have felt really connected to their caregiver, but also really afraid of them at the same time.
And this is the one that's been really fascinating to work with because there's both anxious and avoidant tendencies here, and it can mm-hmm. oscillate between the two. And this can be an immigrant family. You know, this is the one I related to growing up the most. My family left their entire village when I was four years old, completely cut off from everyone, not cut off like not speaking to, but you know, really having to start from the ground up all over again. So when I work with Im- a lot of immigrant, cl- immigrant clients or people that have had these kind of systemic traumatic scenarios, there's often so much trauma in the system, which can make, you know, relying on people really, really scary. Mm. And so, you know, there's a lot of factors that create this environment for this fearful attachment to take place. Yeah. Does that knowing- make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. And I think of like, you know, when you're dating someone that if their attachment style is different, that can change your attachment style. Like if you're secure and all of a sudden you date someone who is scary or someone who is really avoidant or anxious or whatever, it can cause you to want to pull away or come closer or whatever it might be. And, you know, just that sense that it's not a stagnant thing. And what's good about it not being stagnant or this stasis is that we can change it. So it's not just like something that changes within us. Um, and and when I think about that, it's like the, not only is it important to understand your own attachment style, but also the partner's attachment style. Because, you know, like when I think about when Kai and I first started dating, she's not here to defend herself. So I get to say whatever I want. Um, but she was 100% way more avoidant. A hundred percent. And I was secure, but prone to anxiety. So it was a perfect match. Um, And I remember saying to her, like, I think it would be really valuable if you learned attachment styles. (laughs) Because, because, man, I can't keep dealing with this avoidance. Like, it was frustrating. And she, she started to read that book on, on attachment. And uh, she didn't read it all. She didn't get to the part on avoidance, which I thought was really ironic that the avoidant person avoided the book. Um, And it's a joke that we have now because when she read it and she started to learn about attachment theory from the lens of wanting to understand how she was showing up, but also how, how she showed up affected me, it changed everything. Um, and, and that was, the book was called Attached. Attached doesn't speak a lot to avoidance, which I find, um, like it mentions it, but it more mentions it based on how avoidance influences anxiety or anxious attachment. And I think that's one of the real sort of letdowns of the work in attachment theory that is consumed by the general populace is that, you know, the majority of people who seek relational info just by nature of patterns of behavior tend to be more anxiously attached. Um, and, but I think what it does is it sort of, it's like, well, if you're anxious, date a secure person and then you'll be fine. And well, that's kind of true. It's not fully true. And then the other side is if you're avoidant, well, I mean, good luck, you know, like it's kind of like, as opposed to really recognizing that both are insecure attachment styles, and that's why it's easy to pivot between the two because you don't have to become secure. And, and um, they're both just different ways of coping with insecurity. And, and when we can have compassion for the avoidance side, because for some reason, we also code a lot of avoidant behaviors, at least I find, in Instagram diagnoses. Uh, a lot of coding of avoidant uh, styles is as narcissism. Mm. Um, and so there's really this, it's like, well, the person's a narcissist. And you see that all the time in the comments. The person's a narcissist. It's like, okay, calm down on the diagnoses based on four behaviors that you just heard about. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, what do you think about all that? I think you're right that uh, people that have a lot of more of the avoidant tendencies can sometimes be, you know, cast off a little bit. And there is this illusion that they don't really want or value relationship in the same as other as other attachment styles. And I think I agree with you in that it's such a shame because you're right that in, if you go deep inside of that inner child, how it was developed, it was absolutely an adaptation. And people that have a lot of avoidant tendencies, um, you know, they want relationship underneath those defenses. They really, really want right. that 
connection. And there are ways to help them lean into it. There is ways of, you know, taking small risks of vulnerability and really practicing. And of course, ultimately, it's a choice to make that decision to do that. But there, I think there needs to be more compassion, even though I can understand, you know, being in relationship with someone that is, is keeping you at an arm's distance and so challenging to connect. I think when we can meet them with that compassion and really get curious about how it originated, it just, it, it, it offers so much possibility to really see how willing somebody is to really kind of start taking those vulnerability risks. And I hear you. There's a lot of people that, you know, easily diagnose and we have to make some room here for, there's a huge <laughs> distinction. Let's, I'm seeing all the, you know, narcissist comments right now. Yes, it's very, all over Instagram. It's everywhere. Did you watch the last, ba have you been watching the last Bachelorette? No, I did a season where I like commented on what was going on and I was like, God damn, this is like, that actually is a great example though, because The Bachelor of the Bachelorette is a recipe for anxious attachment. Mm, it like sure is. It. It's like, <laughs> I'm just going to date you while you date 24 other people. That sounds great. I can't wait to feel super safe. You know? That's my absolute nightmare as someone that has strong anxious tendencies too. My absolute nightmare. There's no way. There's oh no way. God, I would die. The <laughs> other thing I would do is, is I would get rid of out of 25, I'd be able to get rid of 21 of them right away. Like 20, <laughs> you know? You know what I mean? Like they keep them on there. And I'm like, there's no way. But I've also heard, because I know a uh, few people who've been on uh, The Bachelorette and one on The Bachelor, is that they actually keep some, some people who are like a little, you know, get a little off. The ones who add drama. Uh, they keep them for casting purposes. So you get to choose like out of the 20 you get to choose like 14 of them and the other six are like chosen by the casting people just to keep shit real, you know? My Why is there something crazy yeah. happening this season in The Bachelorette? Well, I think the, you know, I did a live on it a couple of weeks ago, just how more of the terminology is thrown around, gaslighting, this, that, and it's, it's starting to just become, that's why I so appreciate, you know, you starting this live mark with bringing nuance, with bringing this, this, awareness of how important it is to not self-identify in these rigid ways and to really use this map the attachment map as a way of you know to empower yourself to just create a little bit of space between the behaviors that are problematic you know i was like dying to get in there and coach that couple the you know the last one on the, after the final rose i was like no to get in there and get my hands on this <laughs> when you think of all the pressures and like who you're choosing you know i the other side of it too is i sort of look at the the like the term gaslighting like you could say to someone i don't agree with what you're saying and they're like don't gaslight me and you're like no but i like literally actually don't agree with what you're saying i'm not yeah. denying your experience or denying what you're saying and that's been, you know, I mean, we don't have to get into this because that's like a whole other side of like the weaponizing of wokeness and that's the cancel culture, which we can be very dismissive of other people's relational experience, which I think speaks to the greater cultural experience that like me being sensitive to your sensitivities denies my sensitivities mm -hmm. existing. Like that we can't coexist in really healthy relationship, healthy, secure attachment occurs when there's space within the relationship for both people's pains and true intimacy is created through conversation and understanding and building bridges between one another. And um, we're going to build some fucking bridges because I got some questions here. Are you ready? I, but I love that you just said that secure relationships are about tolerating two different perspectives and not just making it about my insecurity and my sensitivity and my vulnerability. It's also, it's about this, this team, this we, how do we create an agreement so that we're protecting and validating both? So amen. Yeah. Okay. Let's do this. Let's build the bridges between everybody. Okay. Right. Hello, Mark and Sylvie. Can I change my attachment style? I can't help but be anxiously attached to anyone I go near and I'm sick of it. But I don't know where to start because I can't get past the initial anxiety when first getting to know someone. Sylvie, break it down. Break it down, break it, break it, break it. We're I like that. Wrapping for you guys, some cheesy wrapping. 
So, you know, what I love about this question, we've, we've talked a little bit about, uh, can I, you know, can I change it? Can I, I'm sick of feeling this way. And, you know, what I want to start off with saying is, again, we've talked about attachment styles being super fluid and that they are going to be greatly impacted by who you are relating to. And, 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 and this is such an important both and conversation, how we are wired, our own templates for our attachment tendencies are going to impact the way we relate to others. So it's mm -hmm. like this dance that's constantly impacting one another. So for example, if I'm someone that has strong anxious tendencies in my relationship in the beginning, when I was with you know, in the beginning of our relationship with Brian, I had a lot of mistrust. I had a lot of, you know, trauma stuff that was working its way. So my brain was looking for evidence everywhere. I was like, I'm going to get him. He's going to do something. He's going <laughs> to confirm. The I'm going to catch that, his ass in it. I'm going to catch him in the moment. I got him. And then I would catch him in like these little things that I would, you know, of course, still val my feelings were valid in that experience. But I just remember having this light bulb moment when I would give myself time to really process it. It's like, you know, first of all, this isn't as big a deal as I'm making it. And this sucks for him. Like he's not getting to feel successful in our relationship. And owning that and recognizing, and I think it was because I had such an awareness of my own, like this feeling of being betrayed, the tendencies, I was able to create space in our relationship. Mm. So it's both, right? It's like, what are the, the things you're looking for? If I'm more anxious, I'm always going to be on the lookout for, oh, they don't care about me. They're not going to show up for me. They're not going to respond to me. Well, if I'm hyper-focused on that, that's what I'm going to see. And so right. it's so important to challenge those thoughts. That's why like in between dates, I always say, give yourself a week between dates. If you're, if you're really anxious or if you, your brain tends to go, your brain tends to go to the negative really quickly and question those thoughts. What are those automatic programming thoughts that are locking you into this thing and see if it's actually true. See if there's evidence of the other side. What is the evidence that they, that they have shown me that they care about me? What is the evidence that's showing me that they are trustworthy or that they're actually giving me a lot more space than my avoidant tendencies are believing that they're giving me? So, yes, someone said it perfectly, the confirmation bias. So it's Amen. both, right? It's, it's yes, if I'm with someone that is really responsive, is tuned into my needs pretty, pretty, pretty well, pretty consistently, my nervous system is going to feel more relaxed and I'm probably still going to look for those things because that's how my nervous system is wired. And how can I learn to dance with this new energy in a way that creates agreements to protect the relationship, not just my sensitivities, but this relationship. Yeah. That's and I want to, and one, I want to let everyone know too, if you're like listening to Sylvia and you're going, this shit is lit. This is on fire. I need help navigating through this. Sylvie and I have partnered. She is teaching Attachment 101 all about how to understand your attachment style, the people you're in relationship with, how you relate to different attachment styles, and how to create security. The link's in my bio, the early bird end Sunday. She's going to guide you through all this stuff. So in that question, what I think is, you know, it's like I can't help but get anxiously attached to anyone I go near, and I'm so sick of it, but I don't know where to start because I can't get past the initial anxiety. Uh, of first getting to know someone. I love what you're saying of like that week between dates because I remember reading a comment from one of your posts that I shared about avoidance and someone said, it just feels like it's game playing. And I was like, that's so fascinating because to an anxious person, it feels like game playing because it feels so, it's again part of that sort of pattern of saying, but I just love, this is just who I am. This is just how I am. If you don't like it, then you're not for me. But a lot of that is I'm going to cancel you before you can cancel me. I'm going to, I don't want to play games when what we're trying to do is rationalize our way around actually creating a little space. And what's fascinating about that as someone who's a recovering anxious, I also like to mix it up. So sometimes I dance in avoidance, but you know, more Thank prone you. to anxiety. When I first sat in that moment of <clears throat> uh, not reaching out, I remember asking myself, uh, if, I, if I really was secure, 
if I really, this was after I just discovered uh, attachment theory. I was like, if I really was secure, would I send this message? Mm. And I was like, no, fuck. I remember thinking like, fuck. <laughs> that means I can't send it. Cause I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna create security. Like I'm gonna do every behavior that makes me secure, no matter how hard it is, which to be fair, I didn't always do it because of course, I had to keep building my tolerance for like holding on to the behavior. Like you said earlier that the anxious person often reaches out yes. to then gain regulation, a sense of regulation, but it's externalizing regulation. And so I had to learn how to sit in that space and self-regulate, which i still, I'm always learning because you can always increase your capacity. But oh my God, I remember, like for this person, I'm like, I get it. And the first part of not doing, not letting the anxiety cause you to leave yourself for connection is like the bravest moment. It's this moment where you're like, you're enough. You don't need to chase fucking people anymore. You're enough. And you do it. You don't do it the first time. And you're like, and then they text you and you're like, this shit fucking works. You know, it's because a lot of people learn it through game playing and through like pickup culture. Yes. Um, but that's just pretending you have high self-worth. That's not true, authentic self-worth. Um, I know I just ranted, but that's, no, but yeah. I, I love, I love that. And I, and I think it's, you know, I, I just want to, like you said, normalize how hard it can be to sit in that space. It feels like torture. It feels so counterintuitive. That's the thing that I think you're you're calling out, Mark. Like it feels like the game playing, but it's it is counterintuitive because everything you've done up until there is not working. Right. So trying on different behaviors is are the tools to start rewiring the in, things that the insecure attachment styles. And one of the things that I would recommend, like if there is anxiety around somebody new that you're dating have other people on standby that you feel safe with that you trust because anxiety does need to be contained and sometimes you know the quickest way to regulate our emotions is a person so i want to also be mindful of like mm, of self -healing, right we need co-regulation but with somebody new when we're still developing that that slow pacing we don't want to you know we want to build up to a deeper and deeper relationship i've always you know when i was dating i had other people that i would call and i would you know, vent about what I was, you know, freaking out about, and they would help to calm my anxieties and my tendency to, I had so much anxiety that I had to, like, I, I had to get out. Like, I couldn't tolerate the dating situation. I was like, nope, find a flaw, find a thing, get out. And so yeah, you I broke up with Brian. I remember him talking about Again, it. Mark? I remember you broke up with Brian. Yeah. He talked about it. I him. was both. Yes, I did. I'm sorry, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> when you guys tell the story, it's, it's okay, so good. You know? so I, good. I want people to know that it's it's okay to have other people to reach out to. Amen. I think it's really important that containment piece because sometimes we can't regulate our own and we learn to self regulate through regulating and that co regulating with other people, whether it's trusted friends, working with a coach, a therapist, someone, a human being that can really support you with that anxiety. Someone who's grounded, someone who you're like, I love how they love. I love how just solid they are and who they are. That's the kind of person, because you're like, basically they have so many roots in the ground that you just attach to one of their roots. And you're just like, oh yeah. It's kind of like when elephants walk together and they hold mm -hmm. each other's tail, you know? You're kind of like in the same sort of safety circle, um, which that was an odd analogy, but hey, it came to me. Um, okay, you ready for question two? Yes. My husband and I have a cycle of unresolved fighting followed by silence. Every time we start to disagree on something, he shuts down and withdraws and magically makes himself busy with something else. Mm -hmm. I want us to come together to work through our problems, but it's always hampered by his avoidance and I feel helpless when that happens. What should I do? Sylvie, this is a common one. This is like, yeah. Like this was for sure. Oh, I've been in relationships where I've been this person and where I've dated this person. So of course it's not specific to um, gender. Um, but yeah, how do we how do we solve this? Solve all of the world's problems. Solve please. the things. 
Well, there's a couple of different angles that I would look at. First and foremost, I would look at, you know, from the self-responsibility piece, I would want to look at how am I approaching <clears throat> these conversations? Am I approaching them with criticism? Am I approaching them with blame? Am I approaching them in these, in these, <clears throat> excuse me, in these intrusive ways that might contribute to somebody shutting down? That's one piece of it. Because it's important to look at our side because sometimes we do things that we're not aware of that contributes to that. And then on the other piece, it's recognizing that this person has a quick window from where they go to being regulated to all of a sudden getting overwhelmed, shutting down, flooding, <clears throat> which is a great term that I love that the Gottman, Gottmans use and uh, coined. And so I'd want to like have a conversation about those things when we're in a calm state. So we know we're going to have this happen again. It's inevitable. This is the style, the flavor of the conflict. Can we sit down and create some agreements? Can we talk about it? Can we, can we take some responsibility for how we're contributing to the dance each? And, you know, secure attachment is about modeling these behaviors first and foremost. So I'm always an advocate right. of taking the lead. You know, this is what I noticed about myself that I did, that I can see how it shut you down. In the beginning of my relationship with that's Brian. That's so beautiful. That's, very, in, that's beautiful. Because that's the vulnerable responsibility that says, I'm willing to hold this and see its impact on you. Yes. And they might not at first be like, that's amazing. Thanks for taking responsibility. You're right. It is your. You, you are the. It. Yeah, yeah. You, it's you. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you were saying about you and Brian. <laughs> So with me and Brian, I know for a fact that I used to be very critical and very blamey and he would shut down and we would, this was our dynamic. And so I was like, hmm, this happens with all of my partners. What's this common denominator? Let me look at myself a little bit. <laughs> my part. Brave. So, you know, so I, I remember we were on a walk on this cool LA night and I just looked at him and I was like, you know, I think I've been criticizing you a lot in my approach and I think that may be contributing you to kind of feeling shut down around me. And I just remember his energy completely softened in that moment. And it was, first of all, beautiful for me to see like that I, not complimenting myself, but to see him have that experience validated and to feel that someone cares about you know that they i don't want to criticize you you know i want to be able to approach you in ways that are going to keep you here to keep you present with me and so that's you know one side of it and if we're modeling that right if we're being vulnerable and we're sharing our side of things it might we might have to let it go in one argument and just kind of let that breathe for a couple of weeks maybe a month or two and then in the future if we continue being vulnerable about our own stuff and we notice the other person isn't meeting us we can call that out you know we can right. speak to that we can say you know i'm really trying to be really honest and open about how i contribute to our our stuff and I would really, really love if you would also take the time to unpack how you contribute to this dance. It's so appropriate to ask for that. And I think so often we don't, and we just kind of want things to just play out and just to magically shift. But we have to have these uncomfortable conversations because it's never easy to invite someone to do that. But that's how we start to create new agreements we're protecting the relationship. Without this, it's going to start to feel really imbalanced. One person is going to lean into vulnerability while the other person might feel more and more righteous in the relationship, right? So how do we start to neutralize and protect this relationship? That's my approach. That's one way that I would start to build. What do, what do you have on that, Mark? Well, I think you spoke to something that's so important is, is I mean, all of it is important. The part about you know, understanding and taking responsibility for your side. Like you talked about the Gottman's work, like that really healthy couples have a soft startup. A lot of us don't have soft startups. You know, their, mm -hmm. uh, their research shows that, real, you know, uh, conflicts uh, essentially end how they begin. So if they begin harsh and they begin with criticism, they're not going to go well. And I think a lot of the times, like I read some of the comments when we were initially talking about this, this partner who's male who pulls away and shuts down and the other partner pursues and you know i saw a lot of comments like my father my martin blah, blah blah my relationship with my mom i saw someone call this person a man child and i think that's that language like man child um 
it shames the behavior and the way like when someone pulls away and shuts down, it's because they're afraid of closeness and conflict. And it can be because their self-worth, they're hearing criticism, which could even be just simple feedback, but they didn't have a healthy relationship with a primary caregiver where that was delivered safely, softly. They were maybe uh, abused emotionally. Like we don't know all the layers that go into this and so I often get just sort of like protective of the compassion that's required to meet that person. We're hurt because they shut down and leave. Um, and so maybe we over pursue not realizing that the constant chasing is actually continuing to injure them because we can't sit in our own space of feeling rejected. Um, and when I think about the patterns in men, because of course avoidance is more common in men, um, uh, at least I, I, if I remember the research correctly. And, you know, I think what's fascinating about this, just speaking from a male perspective, is I think we have such a low, like to, to let our partner down is sort of like our biggest uh, fear, to not be enough, to not protect them, to not do whatever it is. And so we have a really low capacity for inadequacy, for shame. And so like, mm. I really had to learn how to sit knowing that my partner's feedback was actually inviting me to be a greater human, a greater man. And actually without it, I couldn't be. Without hearing how I'm experienced, I can't be better. Mm -hmm. And and so I had to learn how to separate who I am from what my partner is telling me, that I can be better. So when she gives me feedback, I literally in that moment am learning that there's something about how I'm showing up that's not actually okay. But can I sit in that and know that that's not actually my worth. My worth is actually my ability to hear it and to change it. That took so much for me. I gotta tell you, that was like some of the hardest work and it goes against, and I can only speak to this for, for men, that it goes against the socialization that, that, that we are to be disconnected from our emotions. So. What a woman ultimately, and I'm speaking heteronormatively here, what a woman ultimately wants from us is connection and emotion and, and sharing and vulnerability. But what the world says to us is don't have those things or you're not a man. Mm. So we have to essentially rebel against the paradigm we've been taught to be in order to be in healthy connection. Um, and of course, you could argue the other way for women that there was um, the teaching of self-abandonment in order to be in relationship. And so holding on to it is also uh, going against and rebelling, like not putting everyone else ahead of your needs is an act of rebellion uh, for women. And I, and I get that I'm genderizing, but I think that's more often true than it's not. Uh, but you might be any gender hearing what I'm saying and it would be applicable to you because your wounding pattern is that. Um, so those are just some, again, another sort of fucking brain dump. No, I, I, I love that. And I think, you know, what you said about building our capacity to stay present in, in, you know, whether it's hearing feedback or in conflict moments is going to take time. It's not going to just, it's like our nervous systems have to develop a capacity. How do we support one another so that we can stay more present? Someone asked earlier, what is a soft startup? So stop starting softly without blame, without criticizing. And one of the requests my partner has actually made my husband now, Brian, um, you know, in the beginning of our relationship, when I would kind of just blah, like, this is what's going wrong. And I want you to fix it, you know, all the things. He's like, okay, if you can start with some praise or acknowledgement of what I'm doing right, and then let me know, give me some feedback about what you need, that would be really helpful for me. And I think, and my partner resonates a lot with avoidant attachment, and he's very honest and open about this and has given me permission to share all the things. Um, you know, people that have avoidant attachment are often very self-contained. So anyone kind of coming into their space, especially with saying they're doing something wrong, is going to feel super threatening and yeah, like, almost like violating. Like, no, 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 no. I'm solid. I never show you my needs. I never tell you anything you're doing wrong. So how dare you? Right. And so you're really kind of breaking through these huge armor defenses. And so having awareness of that, of how strong those defenses can be, can really be a useful tool when you're engaging with them in those soft startups and to approach them a little bit more sensitively so that they don't shut down so quickly. Just wanted you to know, say 
last piece. One, all these solutions that we're discussing that, that uh, Sylvia is sharing about how to move through these different attachment styles, how to understand each other's world. Sylvia covers in attachment 101. So again, the early bird ends Sunday. If you want to save 50 bucks, go to the link in my bio, sign up, or you can go to the link in Sylvia's bio as well. And it walks you through all these things. Um, okay. Ready for the next question? I'm ready. I feel like we're sort of crushing this. It feels yes. pretty good. It feels I mean, great. I am biased because I mean it, but I'm still like, this is fucking good. All right. I met someone new that I'm excited about, but he takes too long to text me back. It's super hard for me to go without hearing from him, but I assume that my anxious attachment being triggered, and I don't know if he's busy or just taking his time. It makes me feel really up and down. When he texts, mm -hmm. I always respond right away. Am I too excited? Oh, I mean, it's good to be excited. It's just, what do you do with the excitement? You know, mm -hmm. like when I, you know, I'll take a little hit at this, which is, it, it, it takes him too long to text me back, according to our timeline. You know, I think we have to acknowledge that sometimes um, when someone's, there's a difference between someone not being interested and in demonstrating that through their behaviors, where they're sort of like constantly waiting for you to pursue. And then if you didn't ever text them, would you get a text back? You know, like if you have to ask yourself that, like if you stop texting them, would they reply? Would they pursue you? The answer is no, let it go. Like stop chasing people that don't choose you. You know, like I think one of the qualifiers everyone needs to fucking learn is only like one of the qualifiers for your choosing is of someone is that they choose you back. That's simple. Like stop choosing people that don't choose you. And I know that's super hard because of course that's the breaking of a pattern of behavior, which is like, oh, well, my parent never chose me. So I, this is familiar. So I'll just keep trying to heal that. <laughs> yeah, heal it by not chasing it. That's how you heal it. Um, so can you be too excited? Yeah, like I know like when you think about what makes someone appear as though they have a secure attachment and high self-worth is that you're not their number one priority, like that you're important to them and you're the number one human in their life, but they're not like choosing you over their purpose. You know, like I think it's in uh, man, uh, The Way of the Superior Man by David Data where he talks about like, your partner doesn't want to be the most important thing in your life. She wants to be the most important person. And if you sell out your purpose for her, she won't trust you anymore. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing that being like, you know, growing up being the nice guy, which is just a recipe for being a doormat. And I remember being like, oh, wow. Like I have, I have sold out my own integrity to what matters to me mm -hmm. to keep her, to be with her, you know? Um, so when I think about like just taking that space, you get a message from someone, you're excited, and you just hold on to that for like 10 minutes, you know, but not play games. Um, but like, just see how does it hold on to, how does it feel to not just immediately be available and immediately message back? What do you think? Well, I think you're, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head with, you know, that uh, people that have strong anxious tendencies tend to get so fixated on the relationship, which there's nothing wrong with, but where it's coming from, because they're so afraid of loss, they oftentimes forget about themselves, you know, because they have, to, it's again, it's about survival, it's about feeling safe, they forget about their hobbies. I remember for the longest time, I, I was in supporter mode. And again, this has also conditioning to, to being a woman. So there's again, that piece of that, but supporter, supporter in the beginning of my relationship, I was basically just like following my partner around, I'll go to this, I'll go to this. And I was like, wait a minute, hold on. What about my stuff? I, I like, completely forgot about what's important for me and I think you know what you're bringing up is that reminder that yes it's great to be excited about something new there's nothing wrong with that and are you still tending to your own needs in your own life in your own yes. friendships, right so that the person doesn't feel all this pressure when they're relating to you and I want to say there's nothing wrong with negotiating those needs I will say I, right from the beginning of my relationship, I knew in the past that 
I did not have enough check-ins. I waited, there was way too much of a gap in my past relationships before checking in. And I knew that my nervous system could not handle that, no matter how much work I've done on myself. And I told Brian within like, I think it was like within a month or two, I was like, you know, having a morning check-in is going to be really important for me. And mm. of course, his natural connection, he can go he can go a day, two days without checking in and still feel super connected to me. So it's about, you know, negotiating those things without blame, without making the other person wrong, recognizing that just because they're focused on work doesn't mean they don't care about you, they don't want to be with you. But we all have a different capacity and different needs and different um, capacity for intimacy. So I fucking own that shit. And I was like, <laughs> I'm not doing this again. I know that if I don't communicate this need, I'm gonna start feeling resentful, I'm gonna start feeling angry. And I'm not saying that's the thing that you should do, but it's kind of figuring out, okay, what is a, what is a good enough time for me to check in that still gives space to the relationship to develop, but also acknowledges my needs and how can I be clear and direct and respectful in communicating them? Amen. I know, I think like Kylie and I, we have uh, some similar conversations because <laughs> Kylie, when she goes away yeah. on a trip or I do, I don't really feel the need to check in every morning or like say goodnight. Like those are like, they're great and I'll do it when it's like topical or I'm not out doing something with my friend at the time or whatever. Mm -hmm. But she said like, I just need like in the morning you to just take a moment to say like good morning because I usually get up before her. And I was like, I can do that. I can do that. Because she said, like, you know, her mind sometimes will go to, like, I'm not as important to him as he is to me. You know, that there's this old stories that begin to sort of run. And because we're in a secure relationship and I recognize that that is her need, it's important to me to honor it. And I can also honor when, hey, babe, I totally get that. I was busy last night and so, or I'm going to be busy tonight and I won't have my phone with me. So I won't be able to do that. Do you know what I mean? So like, you're like still honoring your own self and the space that you might need from technology or whatever it is, but giving that security, like you're not going to hear from me tonight yes. because, and I love that because like what you're really saying is if you can own what your like non-negotiable connecting requirements are, which is, hard to do in the early part of sort of the relationship yes. because you don't have the rapport and you don't necessarily have the agreements yet. Like when you're first dating and you're anxious because you don't know where you fit or you're on the bachelorette, <laughs> it, it makes sense that you're going to experience anxiety early in the dating process because you haven't created safety and security yet of like, you know, that conversation, what are we? Sometimes we want to get to that conversation, what are we, before the natural progression of the relationship has gotten there. Um, but I think it's like when I, you know, I was dating this one girl once and I remember being like, okay, we've been dating for like three weeks, a month. Um, we were sort of like getting to new levels of intimacy. And I remember saying to her like, hey, if we're going to move further, I just don't want to date other people. Like I need to know that it's just you and I in this process. If, if you want to continue to date other people, that's fair. But I don't want to. And she was like, yeah, I'm in. And I was like, okay. But if she had said, I'm not in, I would have said, I'm not in. Mm. Because for would me you to have not forward, Would you not have given her the rose at the end of the week? I would not. I would have voted her off the island. That's <laughs> what would have happened. I think I'm confusing reality shows. But you know what <laughs> I mean. Excuse me. That was, uh, what was that show called? Survivor. Survivor. Oh. Um, okay. Next question. Um. I've been seeing someone that lights up my world. We've, when we're together, things are nonstop magic. But, there's always a but. Mm -hmm. This is only when we're together, which is usually limited to once a week. I know he works a busy job, but I can't help but think there's something more to it. Is he really that busy? Or could he be avoidant? The time away from him is just so confusing. What do you think? I think, you know, this is a great bridge from the previous question because it ties in a little bit as to, you know, some people can really compartmentalize things more easily. Um, they can go into work mode and be in work mode and really be focused there. And then when they're in relationship and with you, they can be super present. What stands out is that it just sounds like this is not enough 
for you. And that's okay. You know, this is, there's a lot of anxious attachment questions in this, which is, again, there's a common thread, which is really beautiful because we can really bridge off of all of this in that you're allowed to ask for more communication and connection time as long as you're not making the other person wrong or bad for how they're showing up. You know, again, everyone is a different capacity for intimacy and connection. And I think these conversations where we're, we're negotiating this kind of thing is what helps us determine rightness of fit. You know, if, I, if I'm asking for, you know, I'd really love to check in at least two to three times during the week and then see each other once a week. Let me know how that sounds for you. How do they respond to that? Are they defensive? Are they like, oh my gosh, no, there's no way I'm so busy. I, why don't you understand that I'm giving you so much time already versus, you know, that sounds good to me. I'm willing to do that. Or I might not be able to do that exact amount, but this is what I can do. And I want you to know that I really care about your needs. I really want you to also feel safe. Matthew has, Hussey had a really great quote. I was going down his page a couple of days ago and it was, it's not just about how someone makes you feel when you're with them. It's also about how someone makes you feel when you're apart because right. That there has to be con some sense of consistency there in an appropriate way, right? Do I have my own life besides that person? And again, am I, do I have friendships? Am I contributing to my own hobbies, my own, my own work, my own stuff so that I'm not hyper fixated on this person? But the paradox is if I'm not getting enough connection with this person, it makes it harder to connect to, to the things that are important for me. So it's, you know, I'll even say that even in my friendships now, I'm pretty clear from the beginning. Once I know that there's a connection forming with someone, I know that I need a certain amount of connection time. I just had this conversation with a, with a friend, um, I don't know, it was about three months ago, and, I, and I, I recognized that I needed more checkpoints. And I had that conversation with her. It's like, you know, I adore you. You are somebody that I, I'm finding that I am feeling really connected to, really close to. It would be great if we checked in, you know, two or three days a week. I can check in a couple of times. You can check in. And she was game for it. In the past, I would have never said anything. And I think that's the thing. We're so afraid to, especially for those of us who have more anxious attachment, we're so afraid to own our needs because if somebody doesn't respond well, we have to grieve the loss of that. And that can be so painful. And I don't know if you've experienced that, Mark, but for me, yeah. it feels terrifying to, to take that risk to share. Oh my God, what are they going to say? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's such a, um, it's such one of those healing moments too, because you realize that you didn't leave, you didn't leave yourself for the connection yeah. anymore. So you, in a lot of ways, in my experience, I'm also grieving all the times I did. So like, I might experience rejection in that they don't want what I want. But for the first moments when I did that, when I stood in my needs and my desire uh, and, and they didn't say yes to that, I was also grieving all the times I left myself yeah. for people. And oh. that was sad. I got to tell yeah. you, I remember the first time I did some somatic work on that. I was just like, oh, wow, like mm -hmm. that. I've, I've left myself in situations that are not safe and I did it to maintain connection as opposed to recognizing that like, it's never worth that. It's never worth that. Um, and that's why it's so brave to finally be like, this is what I need. And you know, like I hear a, a conversation like this person who is so excited about their dating process and the relationship and the connection they're having. Um, and, and this is only when we're together, which is usually limited to once a week. So what you said is so imperative there is like, what is, how do you keep that light going when you're not just in together, like in person? How do you, how do you uh, like, would you need to check in? Do you FaceTime a couple times a week or, because it can be that someone's reality is that their job is super busy. And you're also saying yes to someone with a super busy job. So you can't then resent them and make them wrong because of what they do. And they mm. present it to you clearly. Like I saw comments like he's a player, he's dating other people. Those are all assumptions that prevent us from having to have the conversation and already be hurt and let down or protect someone else. And, 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 and there are assumptions that make it so we don't have to have hard conversations where we might get our need rejected. We reject them or make assumptions about them and their character. Mm. 
Beautiful. You know, which, Ugh. which is not fair to do. It doesn't mean that you won't sometimes be right. But instead, you know, it's, it's like we ask the question a lot of the times, like, why do I attract unavailable people? Or why do I attract narcissists? Or why do I attract anxious people? Whatever. The real question is, like, why am I a match for them? And, like, what behavior patterns do I have that match their behavior patterns? What wounding patterns do I have? Like, people who are anxious, who date avoidant people, hands up, recovering over here, is, like, it was a perfect fit. It confirmed my view of the world. My main wound as a child and as a, an adult, but I'm careful to use the word adult, is that it was that people don't choose me. They don't see me. They don't, like, prioritize me. But I would say it's mainly they don't choose me. And so, of course, who's the perfect person to reenact that? An avoidant person. And that was that is the greatest gift I ever got was finally being aware to my attachment style, my partner's attachment style, and how to heal it. Because then Kai was the greatest gift to ever have been brought to me because she presented me the opportunity and I presented the opportunity to her to both change our patterns so we could be in a secure, safe, not codependent relationship, you know? I'm right there with you, Mark, on all the things. I think you, you're my, you might be my twin. <laughs> So if I can't pronounce your last name in Armenian, so I'm not a very good twin. Well, we're going to work on that. We're going to keep working Hul on that. Hulgasian. Hulgasian. <laughs> Hulgasian. Okay. Yeah so, yeah. so, yeah, what do you think about all that? I think you're, you know, you're hitting the other side of it, which I love, is that, you know, there's so much of like, oh, they're an avoidant. They're this, they're that. First of all, again, being careful of throwing around this word, are they that? way or are they maybe just not interested are you are they, like you said are is this their lifestyle and also checking in with self is their lifestyle going to work for me instead of waiting is this person going to choose me are they going to meet my needs hold on what is it about them that i like that i admire not just this not relying on just the feeling i have with them but also bringing logic to that how do I feel with them? And in the sense of in between those dates, is this person willing to accommodate what I also need? And bringing, someone said objectivity. Yes, objectivity to this so that we're making that choice from a place that also acknowledges and chooses self. So I think it's beautiful that Amen. you're, you're naming that. Okay, are we ready for the next question? Yes. My last relationship only lasted six months. I was anxious, he was avoidant, and he ended it abruptly when things got difficult. Since then, I've done a lot of work and reflected on my part, and I am well aware of the dance and my role in it. Even though we had so much in common and we were great together, I know that I don't want him back. Bam. But, but, my favorite, ass all the time. Everyone's always butting. I keep... I still keep thinking about him and a part of me doesn't want to let go. Why can't I let go? Because you're a beautiful heart centered human that right. has feelings. Like, yeah. It's like, there's this expectation because we end something with someone. It means that we don't grieve them. And I think that's so sad and so far from the reality, especially mm. for, for those of us that, you know, I think all of us love deeply, but maybe the ones, people that have less guards around that, their heart. Um, I mean, I grieve my friendships that I've had to walk away from all the time. I make space for my grieving on a daily basis. And I think that, you know, I think it's beautiful to acknowledge that we have to walk away because this is what we need to do to take care of ourselves and protect ourselves. And it's so important to make space for that human part of us that just right. loves, right? Uh, I love that you said that because there's some hot idea that we're flawed if we still think or miss them, which, you know, when Kylie and I broke up and then got back together, but like in the breakup part, what was really beautiful was that for the first time in my life, I chose this different way of ending where it was like, we have to remember that it is an act of rebellion to keep your heart open through the breakup process. We're taught to hate the other person or do this or that or, and, or talk shit about them as opposed to navigate it with grace 
and recognize that because the container of a relationship closes, which this isn't about making every relationship last forever. This is about being in truth. This is about being authentic. This is about finding relationships that align and sometimes relationships don't align and that's okay. This isn't about each person um, shape shifting to make the relationship fit, but rather allow the relationship to be a container that holds both people fully expressed. And when our relationship ended, I, for the first time in my life, really saw that a, a relationship status changing, love didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. If anything, love got richer and deeper. And um, I sort of got to witness in the grief, the amount of love that was truly present between us. And so when I hear someone like this say, like, why can't I let go? Well, you're in the process of letting go. What I would say is when we get stuck in the grief because we don't fully accept the ending, then it becomes a prison. It becomes a thing. Because sometimes we can, like, rumination is a way that we still feel love for people. You know, it's like a way that I can, and we might still have a pattern of rumination from childhood. Like we ruminate what's possible. We ruminate. Um, maybe we did that when we were left alone at home. You know, it can happen. So I think when when the grieving becomes the place we stay, like a lot of people will say, well, my heart's broken. I can't, you know, I'm, I'm moving on, blah, 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 blah. And I, I really think like a broken heart isn't a grieving heart. A broken, because that's certainly not true. It's open. A broken heart is one that doesn't doesn't open to loving again. Mm -hmm. That doesn't like allow endings to be, because you're really like an ending of a relationship is really just a turning of a page or a chapter in a book, but the actual story still continues. Um, and how do you stop rumination? Well, you get busy, you, you hang out with friends, you share about your grief. You know, you, you process it, you sit in it, you make it sacred, you have ceremonies, you pull up a meditation on insight timer. I have a breakup course, which is all about closing those doors. Um, but I, I love what you said, that it's such an indication that you're just a fucking human. Like, can it just be that simple? I, I really think there's a lot of judgment culturally. And I don't know if it's, I'm here in the West, it definitely feels like just such a, such a difficulty with being with the emotion of grief because it's difficult, because it's so complex and this ex expectation to just move through it. But it's so nonlinear grief. I mean, I remember even when I would date partners, I would still be grieving partners for like 10 years. Not from right. like, I can't function. I still like, grieve them sometimes. Yeah. It's not because I want them back. It's exactly. just because maybe there are moments I have awareness where I could have been a better partner to them. And I'm like, ooh, I'm grieving that that I didn't show up well for them. And that's my hope is that like we all can, you know, we can all expand our capacity to tolerate grief being part of our lives because it's not just about you know the death of a person in physical form, but the death of one form of a relational container, whether we see that person anymore or not. I think sometimes like knowing that someone is out there in the world that we just don't communicate with anymore after having such a depth of intimacy, how could we not grieve that? You know, and I think you said something important about the rumination. And if we get stuck in that place, of course, you know, working with a professional that can help you integrate that also can be really, really valuable to make sense of things, processing it, ritualizing it. I love that. I'm actually waiting to do a, a ritual with a friend who's going to be helping me with um, some friendship grievings that I've been going through. And I think that's really important too, to, mm -hmm. to be witnessed in our grief by the people that really love us and support us and that can help us hold that. Maybe it's a partner that can help you hold it. Maybe it's a friend, but I'm a big fan of that. And your course sounds awesome, by the way. <laughs> well, it's all about just stop fucking around and close the door. Let's process this. Let's move on. Let's use it as a superpower to move forward. And, you know, I saw a comment that said, I'm, uh, I'm, I think it's such a shame that there are not more men here. Uh, you're grieving something that you don't even know how many there are here, right? Like that just perpetuates a belief. You know, I hear from both men and women that there's not men or women who are doing the work or this or that. And what they do is you'll, you're never going to see them because the way the mindset is framed is to not see them, to validate a belief that there's not people doing the work. There are always people doing the work. And, you know, we say like, well, as I do the up leveling, I feel like the available market got smaller. Yeah, that's the whole fucking point. 
That's actually the whole point. Um, but you're more concentrated in how you're choosing. And when you're more concentrated in how you're choosing, you're not going to waste your time with people who are not a good fit. You know, Mark, I think we're going to have to do some matchmaking together. We're getting all these. I'm here. I'm right here. See, like what? all these men are like, yo, Woo we're up in here. Why are you, why are you so sad that we're not here? We're right here. Exactly. So I hope that just shattered your belief because you were made sad by a belief that you thought was validated by men not commenting or you assuming men are here. And so I don't say that to call you out, but rather to invite you forward. Um, okay, last question. <clears throat> Hi, Mark. I've done a lot, and I mean a lot, of work on myself, and I'm happy to say that I mostly identify with a secure attachment style. My new partner shows many avoidant tendencies and I'm worried as we get closer, all my hard work will be undone. How can I move forward without regressing? Mm. Great question. Well, listen, I mean, your hard work can't be undone. If it gets undone, you're not done the work. You know, that's the, like an avoidant partner is just an invitation. You know, I think this is speaking about, most of these questions have been very focused on how an anxious person deals with an avoidant person. Maybe we can answer this from a, another perspective of um, if you're avoidant and you have a secure partner who's saying like, I love you and I'm, I'm ready to choose this. Mm -hmm. How do you as an avoidant person move through that, move towards that? I think that's such a beautiful invitation. I love that. And I think, you know, this is where we each have different things to step into you know for someone inc we've been talking about anxious attachment quite a bit and what they can do to really work on owning their needs learning to lean back space having more people to support them going back into their own hobbies and things that are important to them those are the areas of focus and for someone that has more avoidant tendencies it is recognizing you know that there has been this need to really be self-reliant for very important reasons. That was your only option. And there's a lot of grief to be acknowledged within that when you start to step into relationships. So, you know, I would say is practice small. If I'm giving like very specific, tangible, practical things, practice with small vulnerabilities. If it's too hard to do it with that person, start practicing with other people around you that feel safer so you can start to build your tolerance for sharing yourself sharing your thoughts. Again, while you're still honoring your boundaries and your limits, but sharing your, your thoughts, sharing your feelings, getting in touch with your needs throughout the day. When you're hungry, paying attention to your body cues, because again, these are things that can oftentimes be, you can be really detached from because it's been, nobody's really tuned into those places. So the more you can also take time to acknowledge your needs, even in small little ways, Asking your partner, asking your friend, can you get me a glass of water? Can you, you know, I have this favor that I would love to ask you. Taking that risk and being vulnerable is your access point to develop a tolerance. And again, going slow, honoring your pacing. Mm. But if you're not stretching yourself to do this, you're going to go right back into your, you know, armored, self-protective place, which is is not going to allow for intimacy to take form. We've right. talked about this on the podcast, Mark, when we said, you know, vulnerability is the glue of relationships. So if you're not leaning into vulnerability, you're not going to feel connected. So it's not even that right. the other person misses out, you miss out. And that was my biggest wake up call. Like I went on like 300 dates before I met my, my husband now. And I, cause I oscillate between anxious and avoided. And I was like, I don't feel connected to anyone. What is going on? It's like, oh yeah, I'm not being vulnerable. Duh. I'm not sharing myself. <laughs> Keeping the illusion that I was sharing, but I wasn't really sharing things. Mm. And so I wasn't developing a connection. And you know, so it's it's figuring out what feels counterintuitive for you. And they're very different. We talk about this in the course, you know, the tools that we talk about in the course that are very different based on the different styles. And it's up to us. We have to be willing to do that work. No matter how secure of a partner we have, we have to get in touch with these things and take responsibility for that work for ourselves so that the other person continues to feel motivated to move forward with us. That's Amen. what I mean. Like you have to take responsibility for your attachment style. You have to take responsibility for what you want to create. 
You have to take responsibility for how you interact with your partner's attachment style. They have to be willing to take responsibility for theirs. And together, you can change everything. And if you just are single, yeah, and if you're single, you can take responsibility for your attachment style. And what you'll notice is you'll only oscillate in secure relationships, or you'll only always be inviting someone towards the secure space that exists between you and another. So everybody who's listening to this, if you're super pumped about it, you're like, shit, I want to do that. You're listening to the brilliance from the attachment queen here, Sylvie. Click on the link in my bio or click on the link in Sylvie. Sign up for her course, Attachment 101. It's going to take you from your style, how to create security, how to interact with all the different attachment types, and how to create the relationship that you actually ultimately want. Um, the early bird ends on Sunday. So if you want to save 50 bucks, sign up right away. And the course uh, gets started pretty soon. September 8th, I think. Right. Yep. Boom. I got the date right. All right. I'm so excited. Thank you so I much. You I appreciate ready. you. See you all on there. Have a beautiful day. Thanks, Sylvie. Thank you, Mark.